Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. Surely it's the most well-known of all Bible verses, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. How much did God love the world? He so loved the world. Here is Jonathan Kivis to sing Written in Red. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions. We search the scriptures in order to find the answers. Question number one. Luke chapter 17, verse 37, seems disconnected, and I think the intent was horribly disconnected, from what is before and after it. Please explain. This verse, which comes at the very end of chapter 17, reads, and answering, they said to him, the disciples say to Jesus, Where, Lord? And he said to them, Where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. Certainly this was a proverb in the first century that would have been well known to those. And Jesus uses this as a means of replying to his disciples. Whenever we are puzzled or uh, confused about what is taking place, we need to make sure, make very sure that we do not dismiss the context, but that we study it as carefully as we can 
in which the questionable verse, the, the puzzling verse, is set. And so we find immediately before this that Jesus is talking about his second coming and how that there would be both a suddenness and a certainty of identification. Both the suddenness and the certainty of judgment is being emphasized in these previous verses. For instance, Jesus says, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. A suddenness as well as a certainty of judgment, he goes on to say, remember Lot's wife. And whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. And so when he says, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. He's talking about just as there's a dead body and all of a sudden there are vultures. They seem to come out of nowhere, but they have that sense of where there is something that they can prey upon, that they can descend upon. And so a suddenness, an unexpectedness, there is that as well as the certainty of God's work in the final judgment of this world. Question number two, if a person is not baptized, a believer's baptism, will they still enter heaven? The classic verse that is we refer to repeatedly is Luke chapter 23 and verses 42 and 43, the penitent thief that was crucified beside Jesus. He was saying to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, after he has rebuked his other thief compa companion on the opposite side of Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. That man he did not have any opportunity to be baptized before he entered into heaven. He was simply ushered there. And so the first answer is, no, you don't have to be baptized in order to enter into heaven. I'm sure that in heaven there will be many others who did not have that opportunity to be baptized. However, I also want to take you to Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 41. This is immediately at the end of Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost. The people cry out to the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter's response is, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. And what did they do? Verse 41 tells us, So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So the strict answer is, do you have to be baptized in order to get into heaven? No. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that's applied to our hearts and that cleanses us and that we, whereby we are forgiven. That is how we access heaven. But when there is such a pointed and direct word, such as Peter gives here, repent and be baptized. The question is, if there is any opportunity, why, oh why, oh why, would anyone who is trusting in Christ and wanting to walk in his ways to be his true disciple, why, oh, why, oh, why would they delay, put it off, or consider it to be of secondary importance? Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. Our mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. The male quartet now comes to sing Love Grew, and then Heidi Taves and Tim Sturby team up to sing, I will glory in the cross.
A year ago, it was a privilege to take my mom's very well-worn Bible and starting with her favorite verse, Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, to preach from that passage which she had marked in her Bible as well as 11 others. Those messages which I preached in her honor, I have now taken and included in this book entitled Mum's Bible. I would like you to have a copy of it. I have also included a few pages of biographical sketch of Mum's life, and th this is yours simply for the asking. Your copy may be sent to you free and postage paid when you write to us at Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C, 2H6. You may also call us toll free 1 833 367 3852 and our website faith to live by.ca also has a contact us tab whereby you can send us a message and request the book Mum's Bible. We'll see that that is sent out to you directly. And now we have Heidi Taves coming to sing Psalm 103. Jesus had been buried. The guards knew that he was dead. The chief priests were confident that he was dead, although they were suspicious of his disciples, of Jesus' disciples coming to try to steal him away. And so they had a seal placed upon the tomb and they had a guard set there. But we read in Matthew chapter 28, verse one, now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone 
and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Who is this man? He has been crucified on a cross. He was thrust in the side with a spear. The, the soldier wanting to make perfectly sure that he was dead. Yes, he was dead indeed. There was no life left in him. He was placed in Joseph of Arimathea's borrowed tomb and there for three days. But now, on the day following the Sabbath, he is alive. A great earthquake takes place, and the stone is rolled away. Those burly guards who had been positioned there in order to ward off the disciples and their feeble attempt to overpower them, they were nowhere in sight. They had no idea what was about to take place. Some women had come to pay their respects but they meet up with an angel, and the angel says to them, he is not here. What joyful news. Do not be afraid, he says, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, the one who has been crucified, just in case there be any misunderstanding. You are looking for the man called Jesus, the one who was crucified. He is not here. He doesn't need a tomb anymore. He has risen, just as he said. Jesus, we answer the question today. He is the one who has bested death. He is the one who has overcome the ancient enemy of us all. He is the one who has life in his hand and in his power and in his grasp. And he offers it, offers it to each and every one of us. Jesus had told, he had prophesied to his disciples what would take place as they continued their motion and their movement towards Jerusalem. He said to them, the Son of Man will be taken, he will be betrayed, he will be handed over into the sinful leaders, he will be tried, he will be crucified, but on the third day, he will rise again. He was speaking of himself. He knew what was coming, but he knew the glory that was most surely, assuredly to follow, that he would rise again. And the angel says, just as he said, it has indeed happened. Do not be afraid. You can come and see the place where he was lying. And then the word, go and go quickly and tell his disciples. His disciples are in the depths of despair. They think that all is lost. Their world has been utterly shattered. Jesus had spoken to them about this coming straight on ahead. But yet, it was as though he had never spoken a word to them. They are devastated. And they 